So we're going to take a few minutes and talk about wiring errors and the resultant EMF that comes from them, and that would be magnetic fields. AC magnetic fields at 60 cycles per second. Wiring errors are a problem that most people don't know about in the, in the general public, and even in the trades, most people don't know about wiring errors. The problem is they occur in about a third of homes, conservatively, in the United States. In some parts of the country, particularly where I am in Los Angeles, Southern California, up to 50% of homes have these problems. What we're talking about is misconnections, mis, uh, miswiring of connections between neutrals from different circuits or between a neutral and a ground in the branch circuits outside of the breaker panel. So the problem with wiring errors is they are actually a violation of, natural, uh, of the National Electric Code. So let me actually uh, explain to you what those code violations are and what they say. So when neutrals are connected together from two different circuits, and I'm talking about two 12-2 circuits or two 14-2 circuits coming into a junction box together, then uh, that is a violation of national, national code, technically. And the code citation is 300-3B, which states all conductors of the same circuit and where used the grounded conductor of all equipment grounding conductors shall be contained within the same raceway, auxiliary, auxiliary gutter, cable tray, trench, cable, or cord. 310-4 states conductors may not be paralleled, that is, joined at both ends, so you can't join two neutrals at a junction box because they are also joined at the circuit breaker panel where they terminate at the neutral bus. Current flow on two or more neutrals poses a shock hazard to electrical personnel. Also, the magnetic field that is generated when that happens will cause uh, disruption of the functioning of sensitive electronic equipment like computer servers and computers. But there are also health implications that we have been talking about in the videos that we've been uh, taping here where we have brought up studies that are conducted outside the United States, principally, uh, that show health um, hazards and health risks in, uh, in people in buildings that have wiring errors or uh, magnetic fields from power lines coming in from outside or from the other sources of magnetic fields in the home, which would be transformers and motors as point sources or current on the grounding paths, like water, middle water pipes. Any of these sources will cause magnetic fields that can cause ill health in people, and that's documented. And all of us who are building biologists who measure these fields in clients' homes have clients who have um, many different kinds of uh, illnesses, including cancer, that um, the, the medical practitioners who these people go to can attribute uh, uh, to the fields that are found in their home. Now, this is actually discussed in great detail in a book by a gentleman by the name of Carl Riley. Carl is a retired science teacher in North Carolina, and he wrote this book, Tracing EMFs in Building Wiring and Grounding, and Carl spelled with a K, R-I-L-E-Y. And this book was written after his experience with going to California from North Carolina uh, at the invitation of electricians in the 90s when they found um, magnetic fields in classrooms at this particular school or group of schools. And in conjunction with the electricians, they found wiring errors and he wrote this book about it. This is the second edition. There's actually a third edition that's been published. And in the second edition, Carl says when he first um, introduced this and started discussing this uh, among electricians and uh, with the National Electric Code, they kind of scoffed at him, uh, even though there are provisions in the code to this effect. But uh, at the time, there wasn't a lot of recognition of this. Since that first edition, he's actually been asked to join the uh, committee that uh, evaluates the National Electric Code provisions every three years when they revise the code. So he's on that committee and he's been um, asked by electricians all over the country to help them uh, with tracing and finding the EMS as he discusses in the book. And furthermore, uh, Southern California Edison, the electric utility in Southern California where I live, around Los Angeles and through Central and uh, California down to San Diego, they invited him to come to their offices in Los Angeles and they filmed a 23-minute video where Carl explains, similar to this, with an electrician, how these wiring errors are created and how to fix them. So he's a resource for this, and the EMF consultants for Southern California Edison give his video to customers who call them up for EMF evaluations. So there's precedence for this. There's um, interest in it. Uh, we 
uh, apply these principles in terms of the health effects that these wiring errors can, can cause. Now, let me explain to you how these wiring errors occur. This is a um, sketch or diagram from Carl's book, which, which shows a neutral to neutral wiring error, one of the two types that occur. The other type is the neutral to ground wiring error. And here's what's happening in this diagram. If the panel's up here, and here's a circuit, let's call it circuit four, coming in from the panel, going in on the left side here, and this is the hot conductor going to a load up in this room, like a refrigerator or some motor drawing three amps. And then this is a circuit, let's say it comes by a different path, circuit seven coming in on the left side here, and that hot then goes to loads in this room. The hots are separated, and of course, if they're on the opposite legs, I believe, they will trip the breaker immediately when the electrician turns them on, so he'll realize that he's ganged together hots from two different legs, and he'll separate them, um, or she, and, and solve that problem. But the question is, why are the neutrals connected together here? They're not supposed to be. We're talking about two 12-2 circuits. Not a 12-3 circuit, but two 12-2 circuits, or 14-2 circuits. The neutrals should be separated just as the hots are, and this is exactly what we teach our students in the building biology training at the advanced EMF seminar. So here's what happens if current 3 amps comes down this hot wire, goes through this J box, up to the load, and back on the neutral wire here. Everything is fine in this section, in this leg, from the J box to the load and back again. But at this point, because of joining together of two circuits, two neutrals, from two different circuits, both of which go back to the, breaker, the same breaker panel, or if this is a sub-panel for this one and this goes to the main panel, it doesn't matter. It's all ending up back at one or, one or uh, several sub-panels. Uh, the problem is that three amps then splits, and some of it goes this way and some of it goes this way. So for the example here, to make it simple, let's say two amps goes this way and one amp goes this way. Now, current will take all available paths to get back to the source. It does not take the path of least resistance exclusively. Electricity or current takes the path of least resistance primarily but it will take other paths if you provide other paths to that current. And that's what's happening here. Here's the problem with that from our standpoint. If you have three amps coming out on a hot and continuing through all the way to the load, and you have three amps coming back on this section, in this section from the load to this J box, you have three amps on the hot and three amps on the neutral, and the magnetic field around the hot, which goes, say, clockwise from the right-hand rule, in terms of the electrons flowing around that uh, current flowing up the hot wire. So looking from behind, up in this case, you'll have a, a clockwise flow of the electrons. And then when the current comes down the wire, then the thumb is pointing the other way, and now the right-hand fingers are going counterclockwise. And so the magnetic field of the hot goes this way, the magnetic field of the neutral goes the other way, counterclockwise, and they're equal in current load, and, and the two conductors are side by side. So those magnetic fields will superimpose and cancel each other, and there's no magnetic field that is measurable with a Gauss meter in the room, which is what we want. That's the condition we want for our clients. Now the problem comes that when that three amps gets to this point, two, of it, two amps goes this way, and one amp goes this way. So what you have here is what we call a net current on this path from the J box back to the panel. Three amps on the hot, so if I take a clamp meter, like this triplet 9200A uh, clamp meter, which is self-contained. This is one example. We use this all the time, 9200A by triplet. And we clamp, we turn it on, and we're measuring amps, AC. And if we clamp around the black wire and measure 3.0 amps, and then we clamp around the white wire, and we measure 2. So we clamp around the two of them together, which is the net for the circuit going out of the J-box we get a difference of one, high minus the low. So we have a net current of one amp back from here to the panel, which could be several rooms away. And likewise, we have a one amp load on the neutral of this circuit, potentially with nothing on the hot. So that, the load could be off. Loads could be off in this room or these rooms, served by this hot uh, conductor. So zero on the hot, I'll put my clamp on this, like we're going to show you here, and I have zero amps here, and I have one amp here, because that's the difference, that's the deficit 
over here, which has to get back to the panel some other way. It could be on this neutral, or it could be on the ground. We'll get to that. And so we have a magnetic field from this circuit as well, which goes on a different path to get back to the panel, perhaps to another panel. If it goes to another panel, then there will be a deficit all the way back to the starting point of the whole infrastructure back at the main panel. What this causes is a magnetic field when the load is on. And I, we see this all the time in our practices. So let's demonstrate this with the setup that we have here on this board. We're in the Internachi House of Horrors, the training uh, house that Internachi has uh, created here in their warehouse in Boulder, Colorado. And this is the electrical room. And we have examples of what home inspectors may find and what, what they should be finding and, and what they, uh, in terms of the correct things, and then the defects and the problems that they may find. And uh, Internachi has been gracious enough to uh, be willing to incorporate the examples that we come across, that we feel are important in our work, in terms of the health of our clients, uh, to, to be part of their permanent display here in this room. So as their students come through once a month, uh, they're going to be able to see this. We're going to put um, photos of the insides of each of these boxes here. This will remain open. We're also going to have a schematic here to show the right way and wrong way. Um, and we'll have a clamp meter here and we'll have a gauss meter to show the students who come through how, how this works. Now, home inspectors can help their clients by carrying a gauss meter. Uh, and one of the gauss meters that uh, they could use is um, this one. This is the Gauss Master, and it's only $35. And you press this button here to turn it on, and it's an analog meter. Uh, and we like to see the level at 1 to 2 milligauss. That's the green part here. And then 2 up to about 7 is the yellow. Um, and then 7 or so and above is red. We would say anything above 1 milligauss is potentially harmful. And that's been, uh, the evidence for that has been reviewed in other videos that we've been uh, taping. So this is one thing that the home inspector can carry in their pocket. And then if I can just reach here, this is another one that a home inspector could use. Uh, and this is a um, $270 or $300 meter uh, made by Magni Eye. DSP 523 actually is $320. And this is a triple axis meter. And right now, we're seeing a level of 0 0.3 milligauss, 0 0.2 milligauss in this location, which is a good level. This is healthy as far as we're concerned. It's well below 1 milligauss. We consider this to be healthy. As if this was a sleeping area, this would be right on the edge of what we consider the no concern level to begin, 2.2 milligauss and below. Even 0.2 to 1.0 is slight concern. and. Um, in some places, you can't get lower than that, and that's OK for healthy people. But lo the lower, the better, particularly in the sleeping area. But in a moment, you're going to see that this number will go up substantially. So when we turn on this switch, which turns on this load here, we have an elevation of this magnetic field. And we're now up to 1.3, 1.4 milligauss. And we're a few feet away from this wall here. And what I want to do now is turn on some heating pads, because the amount of current that is flowing from this light bulb is only, and here I'm going to just clamp around the black wire, it's only 0.3 amps. So that's not much of a uh, current load. But there is a wiring error here, which I'm going to show you in just a moment. But if we turn on this heating pad, I'll turn the light off, just to show you, the heating pad itself draws 0.7 amps. And for demonstration purposes, I actually want to take out this light. So I want to plug in this other heating pad. So I plugged in the second heating pad. So we now have a total, according to the, so I'm just clamping around the black wire here, of 1.8 amps. So what is the magnetic field out here? Now it's uh, 2 milligauss, 2.5, two 3. And if I hold this. I have to hold it this way, and you actually, you can't see that from the camera, but it's up to 2.5 to 3 milligauss. And another gauss meter that some of you may purchase is this one, the tri-field meter. And we put it on the 0 to 3 scale, and there is the elevation shown with this. 
And when I turn off the loads, it goes to zero. Turn it back on again. There's our load. And here's another Gauss meter. This is the professional NFA 1000 that we use in the building biology profession. And the nice thing about this is not only does it give you a number, but it has an audio feature. So it's 0 0.2 milligauss, as I mentioned. I'll turn on the load. And because of the wiring error that we've created here, we have a 2 to 3 milligauss load in the room. Now, we're actually going to show you um, a defect and a wiring error that we have with the three-way switches that we've installed. And there's going to be a much, much higher uh, magnetic field with that. But there are magnetic fields that are well in excess of the numbers that I'm showing you here, 5, 10 milligauss with a neutral to neutral wiring error. Uh, it all depends on the load. It's all load dependent. And when you turn the loads off, so all I have to do here is turn these off. And the field goes away, even though the wiring error is still present. It's all load dependent. So let me explain how this works. The current comes in on this uh, demo board from this um, outlet here. And in this case, it comes up on this 12-2 circuit through this switch box, through here, and, and it just travels right through this to the load. Here are the hot, here's the hot in and out. Here's the neutral in and out. But in this case, we have another circuit in this junction box it happens to be a lighting circuit, and that's represented by these wires up here. But what the electrician did was he put all of the neutrals together in one grouping. And this is the violation of the national code uh, citation that I mentioned earlier. So what happens is current goes through here, and the one on the left is the load. So I'll show you here. We have, I have to turn them on. So here's our load of 1.9 amps. The rule of thumb is, to avoid these problems, we need to have 1.9 amps go back. And here's the 1.9 amps here. This is the 1.9 amps coming from the load. And it should be going back on this. These, these are reverse, so sorry, we'll do it this way. All right, so this is the 1.9 amps going over here. And this part, which goes back to the to the panel should also be 1.9, but it's not. It's 1.5. There's a deficit of 0.4 amps, almost a half an amp. It's on this wire here, going back almost 4 tenths of an amp, going back on this path here on the other circuit. And there's none here, because that's going up to this load this box here, which has no load on it. So this is an example of how a neutral-to-neutral a -neutral wiring error would work. That is, the current comes through on the hots in the full amount and goes out in the branch here. But the neutral is connected to a neutral of another circuit, in this case right here, which carries a, a percentage of the amount of current that should all be going back on this neutral back that way. Now here's another problem that you'll sometimes see. This is a neutral to ground connection. Now, a licensed electrician is generally not going to do this, but a handyman, uh, a homeowner could do this, uh, someone who's not paying attention. What do we see here? We see a ground wire under the same wire nut as neutrals. Not uncommon, and we see this. And when we turn on our loads, what we end up with is, once again, a magnetic field in the room coming out from the wall which is not there when we turn off the loads. And when we take our clamp, we find that, again, we have our 1.9 amps flowing on the hots through. And this is the neutral from the loads. There's the, sorry, this side. There's the 1.9. So when I clamp around these two, because these two represent the hot and the neutral going out in this circuit, and there's zero. So that's the point, that in this Romex here, we have zero amps, uh, zero net current on the two, which is what we want. Because 
when we see this on the outgoing neutral uh, or uh, circuit, there's no magnetic field in the room on this, from this portion. But on this side, we have a net current. And the net current in this case is almost a third of an amp. And so here we can see around this, this is from the source, from the panel. We have 1.9, 1.8 amps on the hot. We do not have that amount on the neutral. We have uh, 0.86. And in this case, we have 0.7 on the ground. So let's go back here. So this is the hot and the neutral that go to the loads here. And they net out at zero. However, we don't have the same amount of current on the neutral as we do on the hot on this load. And I just showed you that here. Be and so here's 1.8 on the hot. But on the neutral, just down, as down here, it's 0.8. So we put our clamp around the ground. We have an amp of current on that ground. And that, amp, that current on the ground goes everywhere <laughs> that it can get back to the panel because grounds are all tied together in every junction box, regardless of how many circuits are present. So this needs to be found and, and, and uh, identified and then fixed. And the solution is literally to just remove this, and, uh, and that, that should take care of the problem. So now we're going to show you the effects from three-way uh, three switches, wiring errors with three-way switches. There are actually multiple ways of um, connecting three-way switches. Uh, there's the California method, uh, which is uh, unique and wrong from our standpoint because it creates magnetic fields. Uh, but the most important thing about three-way switches is that you have three wires in your travelers, uh, in, in the conductors or the circuit that is your travelers. That would mean a 12-3 or 14-3 circuit. So here we have two hots, a black and a red, but you always must have the neutral in the same path. That's very critical. Because whenever you have current flowing up on one or the other of these hots, you must have the same amount of current coming back for on the corresponding neutral. There must be a neutral in this circuit. It goes from this switch over to this switch. And it literally goes around this room here and come back, comes back down here. So here are our two switches, and here is the light. So when I turn this on, we have our light, and I could turn that off over here. That's, the, that's how a three-way switch works. The thing is, if the power comes into this switch, as it does in this case, then the neutral current must come back on a neutral in that uh, circuit that has the travelers, and it must exit on the neutral going back to the source from this switch. But what can happen is, some guys will use a 14-2 or 12-2, as we have in this case, on this side. And these two conductors, the black and the white, are both used as the travelers. There's no neutral. We have the ground, but there's no neutral. Meaning, in one configuration, the black wire will carry the current. So let's measure that. We have a third of an amp on that load. And this hap this, in this configuration, the black happens to be the one with the current, but the white has no current. But all I have to do is turn it off here and turn it on here. And now the white wire is a hot wire carrying that current, that 3 tenths of an amp of current, and nothing on the black. The problem is that current comes through into this three-way switch. And then this is the switch leg here for that side the incorrectly wired three-way switch. And this is the load here. And what happens is we are picking up a neutral of a completely different circuit right here. So the current comes in on this. As it turns out, it's coming in on this white wire here, going out on this white wire here. Sorry, on this black wire here. And then it goes into here and up to here, and that can be measured right here on this black as well. So in this portion, we have the correct, we have 0.3 amps on the black, 0.3 amps on the white. So this section here nets out as zero, and there's no magnetic field from this. But right here, 
This is the neutral that comes back from the load. But instead of putting this neutral back through here and back through here, which is not possible because there is no neutral, what they did was they picked up a neutral in this box from a completely different circuit, which is this one down here. And remember, this is from the other earlier example. So this is the neutral that goes back on this circuit to our beginning point. So that means that we have that 0.3 amps here, which jumps onto uh, this circuit right here, this neutral right here, and this neutral right here. But here's the problem. This is a completely different circuit, and there is no current on the hot. It's zero. So the net for this circuit going through the crawl space or the basement or the wall is the full load of 0.3 amps. And all we have to do is take one of these and plug it in. And we're going to get some pretty hefty magnetic fields in this room. Right now, we have our ambient magnetic field level in this room of 0.2 milligauss, which is a safe level, because the uh, loads are off. But all I have to do is flip on this, one of these switches. And now these two heaters are on, and we have a 6 to 8 milligauss uh, field in the room. And it happens to go up the closer I get to these wires that are running around the perimeter of this space. This is a very, very unhealthy situation. This will make clients sick if they have this amount of net current uh, in, and magnetic field in their living room. So now, when we change over to the good side, and now we are avoiding this situation, now we're using this side. So when we turn on these loads, now they're on, but there's no magnetic field in the room. So with the loads on or off, there's no magnetic field. And here's why. Because when they're on, and you can see that they're on because these glow lights are on, and you'll see it from the current. Now we're going on this side, not this side. And one of these is going to be carrying that 1.8 amp, 1 amp load. It's either going to be the red. It is the red, not the black. So the red is carrying 1.8 amps. There's a neutral here. And the neutral is carrying 1.8 amps. So we clamp around both of them, and we get net zero. Same thing over here, net zero. And there is no current on this neutral, this neutral. In fact, that's not even the same circuit. It's actually this one. And this is going through, and it's this one. It's correctly connected. This is the neutral that comes down from the switch leg here with the hot. And it's correctly connected to this one, this wire that goes in the switch to the 14.3 here, which goes out here. And everything is um, canceled. Wherever the hot goes, whichever one it is, to this point, there's a neutral with the same amount of current going the other way. So the solution to this is to find the error, reconfigure it the proper way, and then we have our lights without magnetic fields. So now my colleague Larry Gust is going to explain to you the magnetic field implications of evaluating or living in a house that has knob and tube wiring from the 1920s, 30s, early 40s, where uh, the hot and neutral are separated. He will explain that to you. And also the implications of magnetic fields from conductors that are separated from each other. Orem, thank you very much for the introduction. We're going to talk about knob and tube wiring and then some of the wiring iterations that uh, took place over the years. Knob and tube wiring uh, was used uh, in the early days of wiring, say, from just around the 1900s until the 1930s. And it composed of, uh, of uh, insulated porcelain hangers that wires were, you were put into to be held off of the, the studs and walls, as well as so-called tubes, which were used to uh, get the wire through the wood. And we'll take a look at that uh, picture of that on screen now. And you can see how the, uh, how the stuff was run. And stud spacing is probably around 16 inches. The neutral uh, and the hot wire were separated by 16 inches or more in this kind of wiring configuration. Uh, 
if we have a house like that that has any amount of knob and tube wiring left and there's a very uh, you know frequently electrical rewiring will consist of running modern wiring up to the point at the where the knob and tube wiring goes like up into the wall from the basement or down into the wall from the attic and they stop there and leave the knob and tube wiring in place. This is unacceptable because you will get the effect from the wires in the wall even though the visible wiring has been replaced. So if we take a look at this little uh, setup we have here, um, we've just got an extension cord, a modern day extension cord and we can, we've, we split the uh, leads on it and we can separate the conductors like we would actually be having in a knob and tube wiring situation. So if we turn on the meter and we take a look at the, uh, the wire, the, the magnetic field readings in this room at the moment, we're running, you know, like 0.2 or so, 0.5, 0.3 milligauss. But when I separate the wires, we run up to three milligauss. In other words, it goes up 10 times just for a wire separation of uh, about four inches. Now, the interesting part of this whole concept is this is outside the loop formed by the wires. You can see there's a loop formed by the wires. And then when you, when you get inside the loop from the wires, we have a 46 milligauss field. So in a house, you can picture how these wires might form loops um, between rooms, depending on how electricians installed them, and there really wasn't any, any protocol for installation. They just got the wires around the best way they saw, they saw fit. So mob, knob and tube is very dangerous. High electric fields, high magnetic fields, high electric fields all the time, and, uh, and high magnetic fields anytime you're using a light or any type of other type of appliance. So speaking of electric fields, we can actually take a look at electric fields. And you can see with the wires spread, we're running like 230 volt per meter electric fields. The modern day house will have something like uh, 12. If we get between it, we have 1100 volt per meter electric fields. If we bring these things together, these things are dropping, the electric fields are dropping off to like 50 volts per meter. So you can see from that demonstration there's a big effect on electric fields as well as magnetic fields. So in the 1930s, the concept of Romex was developed. And Romex, as you can see, was a cloth covered wire with uh, two conductors inside and no ground. And so when Romex came out in the 1930s, uh, this problem went away, but not all away. And you can see what the effect was of not all away because we noted that electric fields here were 80, 50, 80 volts per meter. Had there been a ground wire with this two wire extension cord, we would have noticed a marked decrease in electric fields because that ground wire would, would bend and attract electric fields to it. And then we'd end up with, with field levels that would be you know, 12 to 25 or something in that area instead of these 80 numbers we're seeing. So what that tells us is that houses that are, are wired still with the kinds of things that developed in the 1930s and were used uh, into the 1940s or so before a, a thin ground wire was added to this, uh, these houses have exceptionally high electric fields compared to what you would, would get with a house with a more modern wiring. And so that, you know, that is a downside for the people who are going to buy the house. I mean, it might even be termed a deal breaker, depending on how sensitive they are to that type of situation. As a building biologist, I would say it was a deal breaker, unless you planned on rewiring the house. I'd say replacing this wiring with, of course, our modern day wiring, which is uh, plastic jacketed, uh, two wire with ground, which, which solves that, that issue. Now, you know that we talked uh, earlier in this tape about the fact that wire that is uh, in a conduit, which is a flexible conduit, solves the entire problem of electric fields by constraining electric fields to the inside of uh, the conduit. Uh, this is known as MC cable. In older houses before, uh, uh, you know, like in the 1920s, it was BX cable, but it still stopped electric fields. 
In the next segment, we're going to go out into residential neighborhoods and take a look at how distribution lines are run, whether they're over, over, overhead distribution lines or they're buried distribution lines, and how issues with those lines create and can create large magnetic fields can, that can impact residences, even, by the way, when you turn all the power in the residence off and you measure elevated magnetic fields, one of the places that could be coming from are the types of issues that we'll be talking about when we get out into the uh, residential areas.